You may be surprised to learn that there is actually good news to report about domestic abuse. Figures recently released by Police Scotland to cover the period from March to August 2020 show that in the earliest period of the coronavirus lockdown, calls reporting domestic abuse actually fell slightly compared with the period before the lockdown. After a while, the number of calls did begin to rise, but according to Police Scotland, many of the calls within this steady increase were in relation to issues and disputes about child contact. These types of calls do not always result in a crime report being recorded. Therefore, while the number of cases, the number of calls rose slightly, for instance, it was 6% in Aberdeen, the number of crimes of domestic abuse being recorded in Scotland barely changed at all in the six months from the start of the coronavirus emergency measures. Now, isn't that a pleasant surprise? Why hasn't more been made of this happy news? Why, for instance, hasn't Humza Yousaf, the Scottish Justice Secretary, been standing up in Holyrood to proclaim the reassuring message that despite everybody's worst fears about the consequences when couples were effectively locked up in each other's company 24-7 for months, no significant worsening occurred in the incidence of domestic violence. Why haven't all those battalions of feminist columnists and commentators in the press who constantly wail about the menace to innocent women from bestial men, why haven't they been celebrating this unexpected development? Well, the answer is that those facts from Police Scotland are extremely inconvenient. The story they tell is the opposite of the lurid fairy story that we've been fed by the boss class which lines up as one behind the domestic violence lobby. As early as the end of March, less than two weeks after the nationwide lockdown began, Humza Yousaf was handing out an extra 1.35 million to Scottish Women's Aid and an extra quarter of a million to Rape Crisis Scotland. No sooner had the emergency lockdown provisions been declared than domestic violence lobbyists all across the UK were describing them as an abuser's charter and life-threatening to women and children suffering domestic abuse. They claimed that the crisis had created a perfect storm for domestic violence agencies. As early as the 20th of April, Women's Aid was calling for at least 48.2 million in emergency funding to help local services cope with this crisis. That was their words. Then the domestic agency refuge, the domestic abuse charity refuge, claimed that calls to domestic abuse national hotline had spiked by 49%. And those claims were supported by the former Prime Minister Theresa May who told the House of Commons on the 28th of April of clear evidence, she said, that abuse was increasing during lockdown because perpetrators have greater freedom to act and victims find it harder to leave. What evidence was Theresa May talking about? She didn't say. She wasn't asked. On the subject of domestic violence, all normal standards of objective scrutiny are abandoned because the emotional bombast that always describes women and children fleeing from their abusers allows for no measure of critical reserve. And in prompt response to those calls from the domestic violence agencies, in May, the UK Communities Secretary, Robert Jenrick, announced an extra 76 million in funding to help domestic violence charities to meet the supposedly unprecedented demands they face. The Ministry of Justice secured 25 million to distribute to the agencies it already supports. So the total amount of extra public money 
handed over to domestic violence agencies in the UK during the six months of the coronavirus emergency to the end of August probably amounts to around 100 million on what appears to have been an entirely bogus prospectus. And that 100 million was on top of the roughly 300 million which are already routinely handed out by UK governments every year to support those agencies. Thus it happened that while the UK's economy as a whole took its steepest ever nosedive during the coronavirus shutdown, COVID-19 provided an unexpected bonanza for the domestic violence lobby, proving yet again that theirs is an enterprise which is recession proof, inflation proof and absolutely immune to all economic cycles and foibles. In fact, the conduct of those agencies during that period gives a perfect snapshot of the scam that they've been running, unchecked and unscrutinised for 50 years. In general terms, there's a strong case for describing their exploitation of domestic violence as the Western world's most lucrative licensed racket. As Eric Heffer, the late um, Labour minister and campaigner once said, all causes begin as a movement, develop into a business and morph into a racket. And that's what we're seeing with the domestic violence agencies. For instance, it's not easy to dig up figures for this business um, because they, the operators make it as hard as they can to find out where the money goes. And their practices are in flagrant contrast with official guidance. In its 2014 inquiry into charity senior executive pay, the National Council for Voluntary Organisations recommended that for charities that turn over more than £500,000, the charity's remuneration statement should be included within its trustees' annual report. Published in a prominent area of the charity's homepage, no more than two clicks away from the homepage, and alongside the remuneration, the roles and the names of the highest paid individuals. This is to ensure ease of access. Elsewhere in that report, the inquiry criticised charities which indulge in the practice of hiding away the figures for executive salaries in hard to access financial access annexes of their financial reports. Almost without exception, however, the leading domestic violence agencies all flout this guidance. None of them itemises the remuneration the roles and the names of the highest paid individuals. All of them hide away the figures for executive salaries in financial annexes of their annual reports. Why? The most likely reason would appear to be that it, those true figures are so dumbfounded that if they were published openly, they'd bring into question the whole running of this business. You have to dive deep into the annual reports of refuge, for instance, to discover that one unnamed individual has been paid between 210 pounds and £220,000 a year by that charity. Who might that person be who is worth almost half as much again as the Prime Minister? We can only assume it has to be the charity's chief executive, Sandra Hawley. Likewise, you won't easily be able to identify the executive of Scottish Women's Aid, who is paid 80,000 a year, if you look at the accounts. Again, the likeliest candidate would seem to be the chief executive of Women's Aid, Scottish Women's Aid, Marsha Scott, who rousingly declares on her Twitter feed, women's inequality is the cause and consequence of violence against women, or it's the patriarchy, stupid. Well, Miss Scott's idea of inequality may not be the same as yours or mine, seeing as her own salary appears to be about 25% more than the average for chief executives in Scotland. 
But beyond those individuals who are lining their own pockets, it's extremely difficult to pin down the, the finances of domestic violence agencies overall because they almost invariably draw most of their income from the state and that are therefore effectively agencies of the state. The exact sums of their income are hard to compute. William Collins, the UK's most dependable journalist for his investigations of the feminist establishment in his blog, The Empathy Gap, has calculated that, quote, total funding to the domestic violence charities in the UK in 2014-15 amounted to 295 million, of which at least 68% was public money provided by the taxpayer. That figure is astounding enough in itself, but the uses to which all that money is put by the domestic violence agencies are even more flabbergasting. Collins says, of the total income, 64% is expended on staff costs and only an estimated 11% on the non-staff costs of running refuges. In other words, you may suppose that when your taxes are being handed over to refuge or women's aid, the money will largely be spent on providing places of sanctuary for desperate women who are fleeing from their abuser, as they like to say. But no, almost two thirds of that money will go into the pockets of the charity's employees. In order to sustain the flow of loot into the coffers of the domestic violence lobby, the reach of the racket has to be constantly extended. That's classically how Ponzi's work. It's not enough to claim, as they've said for 50 years, that one in four women is subjected to physical abuse by the man she lives with, or that two women a week are murdered by the men they live with. The definition of domestic abuse has to be ceaselessly pepped up and extended. So the latest refinement of this contract has been the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act, which extends the definition of domestic abuse beyond the merely physical and recognises, quotes, the impact and consequences of all types of, of abusive behaviour. This includes patterns of controlling behaviour. So a word out of turn in the kitchen or an ill-advised rolling of the eyes in the bedroom may provide grounds for a complaint to the police and an appearance in court, both of which will inflate the records of domestic abuse cases and thereby give the agencies an excuse to demand yet more money. As it happened, on the very day that that act became law, official Scottish government figures were published showing that the number of convictions involving domestic abuse fell in 2019 by 7%. That was the fourth successive year of decline. Meanwhile, non-sexual violent crime has fallen by 43%. Why did we not hear about that change? Why did not Justice Secretary Humza Yusa celebrate that figure as proving that the billions that have been spent on domestic violence agencies are paying off and that the terrible problem of domestic violence is receding? The same kind of questions apply to figures that were published by the ONS covering homicide in England and Wales for the year ending March 2018. They showed that a third of women were killed by their partner or ex-partner, brackets, 33% equaling 63 homicides in the year ending March 2018. This is the fewest number of women aged 16 years and over killed by a partner or ex-partner in the last 40 years. Why didn't that wonderful news make headlines? Wasn't it something to celebrate that in 2017 only 63 women had been murdered by their men? Roughly half of the two a week that we hear about almost every day through the media? Apparently not. 
Any suggestion that domestic violence is becoming less of a problem would undermine the domestic violence lobby's reason to exist and would threaten the racket at root. None of this is to deny that a serious problem of domestic violence does truly exist. Holding to task the parasites who sponge upon this terrible trouble is not the same as refusing to admit its existence. Anybody who's spent time in an A&E ward on a Friday or Saturday night or who has accompanied ambulance crews through the night in inner cities, as I have, will have seen undeniable evidence that men and women who live together all too often get into fights that cause physical harm. And those fights do inflict immense expense upon the NHS and obviously awful lifelong psychological harm upon the children who witness them. If, however, we truly do want to tackle domestic violence, our first priority would be to discourage excessive drinking and drug taking because alcohol and drugs are so routinely involved in domestic violence that the whole phenomenon can actually be more accurately described as a problem of insobriety rather than anything to do with that fictional boogaboo, the patriarchy. It's also interesting uh, to look at a recent um, figure and graph produced by William Collins in another of his blogs, which shows that that domestic violence occurs least often between married couples to a very dramatic degree and most often between separated couples who obviously are going to be at the highest pitch of emotional um, stress in their relationship and their, relation, their, their rows frequently turn around accusations of wasted money and or sexual impropriety. So if the Scottish Family Party was in power, what we, one of the first things we'd do would be to teach children rigorously about the perils of alcohol and the, and the benefits of abstemiousness and teetotalism. And we'd also teach them the perils and harms of sexual infidelity and the benefits of monogamous marriage. And also we'd go further and teach the dangers of debt and the benefits of thrift. And I think we'd be reluctant to give Scottish Women's Aid one more penny. <laughs>